September 11, 2001 changed our lives. A lot. Political differences seemed to disappear, at least briefly. New security measures filled the world's airports. Thousands of families mourned the loss of loved ones. And, of course, the New York City skyline lacked its two tallest buildings. But there's one change that you probably didn't notice, because it took place inside new high-rise buildings. And it's probably not what you'd expect. Before we dive in, we want to acknowledge that this is perhaps the most analyzed event in modern American history. It was a tragedy, but it occurred nearly 20 years ago, meaning a significant portion of the American population doesn't have clear memories, if any, of what happened. In order to understand what changed, we first need to outline how the towers were originally designed. The plans for a World Trade Center date back to 1946, but those were for a single 70-story building, pretty different from the Twin Towers. The Twins were designed by Japanese-American architect Minoru Yamasaki after his firm won the commission in 1962, a renowned job that landed him the cover of Time magazine. On April 4, 1973, the completed towers debuted as the tallest in the world. But their height wasn't their only remarkable feature. The structural design of the towers, and for that matter, the architectural design was quite unique. This is Ronald Hamburger. He was one of a few structural engineers recruited to do a post-mortem on the Twin Towers after they collapsed. He explained that earlier skyscrapers were built with a mixture of masonry and steel frames with vertical columns spread throughout the buildings. Picture the Empire State Building. It's practically a fortress with 210 vertical columns throughout the building and virtually no column-free spaces. The Twin Towers, on the other hand, were basically steel tubes. Steel columns lined the exterior perimeter connecting to the core of the building via the floors. The floors themselves were made of concrete poured on a steel frame. Note that this concrete wasn't providing vertical stability, just flooring. That was the work of the core's 47 steel columns braced with sheetrock. Finally, also in the core were all of the building's elevators, stairwells, and utility shafts. The reason they did that was so that you could have this massive space of open floor space for use for desks and workstations uh, that would not be interrupted by columns. Each tower was about 95% air, so light that they swayed in a strong wind. Now, a super tall, lightweight building may sound risky in retrospect, but the towers were actually quite strong. So the design was highly redundant. Structural engineers talk about redundancy much like a person wearing both a belt and suspenders. Either one can hold up your pants, but if one of them fails, you have the other one present that can do the job. And this building was highly redundant. Additionally, both buildings were designed with the prospect of an airplane impact in mind. See, in 1945, a B-52 accidentally crashed into the Empire State Building on a foggy day. And 15 years later, two planes crashed into each other above the city, raining debris over Staten Island and Brooklyn. And, and so designers were aware that aircraft crashing into buildings could happen. The World Trade Center towers were designed for the state-of-the-art aircraft of its day. Uh, which was a Boeing 707. But designing a building to resist a 1960s-era plane getting lost in the fog isn't the same as designing one to resist a larger plane being steered at top speed to intentionally cause damage. Near major airports, jetliners are limited in speed to 180 miles an hour. Uh, the aircraft that went into the Twin Towers were traveling in excess of 400 miles per hour. I don't think anyone thought that was a credible event prior to the World Trade Center. 
For our viewers who are just tuning in right now, a twin-engine plane or possibly a 737 passenger jet flying into the World Trade Center. It appears to be still embedded inside the building. The impacts damaged both the outer shells and the cores. But both towers kept standing because of redundancy. Their weight was able to shift away to unaffected columns. But here's the problem. The impacts had scraped the fire-resistant coating off of some of the steel columns and beams. And the jet fuel had ignited a raging fire. This heated the steel to an unsustainable temperature. That the jet fuel burned itself off in a few minutes. But what it did is it ignited all of the contents of the building. The heat of the fires could not and did not melt the steel but it's not actually necessary to melt steel to make the buildings come down. When you reheat steel to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't melt, but it starts to lose some of its strength and it starts to lose some of its stiffness. Eventually, the floors above the impacted areas became too heavy for the weakened steel to support, and both buildings collapsed. You might think that this tragedy would have compelled us to make drastic changes to the rules of how we build skyscrapers. And we have, in some ways that we'll get to in a minute. But structurally... The building code requirements have not changed a lot. The people who had a vote felt that the added cost of the measures that were proposed did not make sense given what was perceived to be the extreme rarity of such an attack. The years since 2000 have seen a rise in super tall buildings around the world. Nearly 9,000 skyscrapers were added from 2000 to 2020. And even though resisting aircraft impact isn't a requirement, many of them are much stronger anyway because of different designs and materials. Rather than using only steel construction, now, most high-rise buildings, super tall buildings, are constructed using concrete walls in the floor, and then steel framing around the perimeter and then the floor system between the core and the exterior wall. Take the New World Trade Center. It's basically a hefty, three-foot-thick concrete core with a glass skin. The end result is a stronger building. This is because concrete is far more fire-resistant than steel, but it's also because concrete itself has become much stronger. So concrete, typical concrete, conventional concrete we use all the time, has a strength 4,000 PSI. Quick pause. PSI stands for pounds per square inch. It refers to the total weight that concrete can support before failing. The concrete used in the floors of the Twin Towers ranged from 3,000 to 4,000 PSI. But that pales in comparison to the strength of newer concrete we use today. The core of the new One World Trade Center, for example, uses concrete ranging in strength from 8,000 to 14,000 PSI. And that's not even the strongest concrete that exists. This is a new, relatively new type uh the concrete called uh, ultra high performance concrete. The hydrogen concrete I'm talking about is roughly from 15,000 psi to 30,000 psi. So greater safety protocols and stronger materials have together created a wave of robust new skyscrapers. Even if protecting against future airplane hijackings isn't explicitly required, but Hamburger told us that some of the world's newest high-rise buildings have been constructed with measures to protect against terrorist attacks. No one will tell you which buildings have been constructed that way. No one will tell you what weapon they've been designed to defend against. But some of them have been voluntarily designed to be better able to resist such events. Do you know which ones? I know some of them. I don't know all of them, and I'm not talking. <laughs> Post 9-11 code changes actually revolved less around structural choices and more around means of egress. In layman's terms, exits. The design of the World Trade Center actually used 
a system that are called scissor stairs. But the stairs were actually fairly close to each other within the core. So when the planes went into the buildings, they managed to block both sets of stairs, meaning that even though people trapped inside theoretically had time to escape, they couldn't. One of the most significant things we've done is we've changed the building code to require more separation between the places where stairways are located so that it is more probable if such an event occurs that there will be at least one stairway available. Additional code changes included widening stairways, self-luminous exit pathways, third stairways in buildings over 420 feet, boosting overall fire resistance, and more. These changes reflect less of a focus on saving the buildings and more on making sure the people inside have time to get out during an emergency. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, hit subscribe and the notification bell so you can catch the next one.